Okay, and Deputy Colonel. Margaret, um, we have very brief time, so I, I hope that the witnesses will be distinct in their uh, responses. Can I first of all just uh, ask all of the witnesses and just yes or no answer from all of the witnesses first? I just want to put something. Do all of the witnesses understand the role and the function of the Office of the Controller and Auditor General, the role and the function of the Public Accounts Committee, and the role and function of Internal Audit? Is everybody here aware of those functions and those responsibilities? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I have to say I found the opening statement from uh, Mr Kelly today to be very serious, uh, very alarming uh, and almost explosive in its content. And I'm sure that Mr Kelly would have been aware of that when he wrote his opening statement. It makes very, very serious allegations and I want to uh, examine those uh, allegations in the statement that has been uh, made. Um, in your opening statement, Mr Kelly, you make reference to interference, non-cooperation and withholding information from internal audit. Who exactly was not cooperating, interfering or withholding information from internal audit? I think I said it out fairly accurately. Said it out again, please, in, for this in, committee. In, in Who exactly? And if you don't want to give their names, you can give their titles um, uh, and their roles. Yeah. I break it down into three periods and in 2008 to 2011 um, I, I, I mentioned a string of emails and, and I think I have that document there somewhere um, between the Chief Administrative Officer, the Executive Director of Finance, the superintendent, Chief Superintendent in the College and the Administrator in the College. They are two different separate people by the way. Um, and, and I mentioned that, and I, I, I give, as part of the documentation, a, a um, string of emails on the 15th of April 2010. So just for the record of the committee, are you saying then, Mr uh, Kelly, that the Chief Administration Officer, which is, I would assume was the previous one, Cyril Dunn, uh, the, one before that. Before that, the Executive Director of Finance, and is that Mr. Colhan? Yes. Yes, and the Chief Superintendent and the Administrator. Are you saying that all of those individuals were part of the non-cooperation, interference, and withholding information? Um, is that your view? Do we have that? That. I'm asking, is that is that who you're talking about? I'm, that's who I'm talking about. You're talking about Mr. Colhan as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Colhan. Uh, do you believe that you were part of uh, interfering with, not cooperating, or withholding information from internal audit? Um, well, uh, yeah. the, 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 I suppose referring to the Barry McGee report. I mean, that was an interim document which left a lot of um, questions unanswered. And you know, I, I return back to my um, minute of 2008, in which I recommended to the Chief Minister Officer that internal audit uh, be brought into this matter. Were you part of interfering with, not cooperating with, or withholding information from internal audit, in your opinion? I follow, in terms of, just to, just to be clear, I report Can to you the answer the question, please? Officer. So in terms of requests go in through the line, so the, the answers should, should be coming out. If, if Mr Kelly is looking for additional information, they should be coming from the Chief Administrative Officer. We are dealing with very serious issues here, Cahirlock. We have the head of internal audit who is alleging, and it's his opinion, and he is doing a body of work, that individuals were part of interfering with, not cooperating with, and withholding information from internal audit. And also, by the way, by virtue of that, withholding information from the Public Accounts Committee, from the CNAG, and from the purview of other agencies as well. Very serious allegations. And one of those people mentioned was you, Mr Cullhan. So I'm asking you a straight question. Do you accept that or not? No, I don't accept that. You don't accept it. Okay, so I mean, I'm going to go to a couple of letters that you did write, um, where you did put uh, things into uh, writing, uh, and we'll, ex we'll explore some of these issues. The letter dated the 24th of October 2015, which you addressed to the Commissioner, we dealt with some of that earlier. This was in relation to Mr Barrett. Have you got a copy of that letter in front of you, Mr uh, Colhan? So we can get it up on the screen. It was the... The letter dated the 24th of October, it was addressed to the Commissioner and a number of other individuals as well. Have you got that, Mr Cullhan? 2015. It's the one we had up earlier. Yeah. yeah. You have it, okay. So, 
you wrote to the Commissioner and you, 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 um, you had a number of concerns about Mr Barrett yep. and you state that John Barrett stated that this matter is not going away and that he would not let it go away. You say that John Barrett stated that the Commissioner should make a Section 41 disclosure and that the matter should be reported to the CNAG. You say that John Barrett stated that if the activities at the College were not fraudulent that they were at best irregular. Which of the above, which of these issues did you find objectionable? Um, well, in terms of, you know, again, it comes back to the whole context. I mean, I'm not looking for context. You keep saying that. You said. There's no context here. You've said it. Yeah. You have said that Mr Barrett stated the matters were not going to go away, he would not let them go away, uh, that the Commissioner should make a 40, Section 41 disclosure, that the matter should be referred to the CNAG, and that he expressed the view that if the, uh, if the activities were not fraudulent, they were at best irregular. You said that. So what, uh, which of these did you find objectionable when you were writing to the, was it all of them? No, I mean, obviously, I mean, there was issues in relation to the college. So, I mean, I, I couldn't object to that because I, I did a report on the very same subject myself. And I did, as I said, I gave a copy of that report to John Barrett. Uh, so, uh, there's issues there in terms of where John is uh, making his views known. I was just recording them as facts. I wasn't no, you go further than that, so Mr. Con. You then say the statements made by John Barrett, you found them to be disturbing and alarming. They were words that you used. They're in that letter. Yes. Uh, so, which statements were disturbing and which statements were alarming to you? Well, I suppose when you take a look, in terms of, I was just kind of trying to summarise the position in terms of actually, um, uh, you know, the, the previous six points made there. In terms of actually, um, again, I would be of the view that in terms of if there's issues in the in the organisation, they should be trashed out in amongst the management team and, and dealt with. Which issues were you referring to when you said they were disturbing and alarming? I mentioned those six issues earlier. I asked you then which of those did you find objectionable? You said, well, none, um, even though it's clear from the letter you do find them objectionable. I then put it to you that you went on to say that the statements made by Mr Bowers were disturbing and alarming. You then refer back to those six issues, and now you're saying that, well, it's to do with the um, fact that he would have uh, posted some correspondence to himself and wanted to uh, use that information in the way maybe he felt was appropriate. Was that your concern? Well, in terms, you know, I find it unusual you know, in terms of, say, if, if a senior officer in, in the Gosh are going to post, finds it necessary to uh, post um, stuff to himself by registered post. There's, uh, the issues um, should be dealt with within the organisation in terms of not in terms of any type of secret or fashion, but I mean, the, the organisation is big enough to take on these things and deal with them. But Mr Colhan, you entirely missed the point. What you've just said there goes right to the heart of why we're here. From 2006 up to 2016, the issues should be dealt with within the organisation. Circle the wagons. You're confirming everything that Mr Kelly said, everything that Mr Barrett said, and everything that I've read from all of the evidence that has been presented to this committee, that that was your mindset. Keep it internal. Deal with this in-house. Keep it from the purview of the PSE, the CNAG and others. No, it don't. wasn't the responsibility of any individual to keep it internal. It was their responsibility, they had statutory responsibilities to give it to people, to give it to organisations. I asked you earlier on, I asked all of the witnesses, were you aware of the role and the function of the Controller and Auditor General, the PAC and Internal Audit? You said you were aware, you were aware of the functions and roles, so you will understand then it wasn't a case of keeping them in-house or internal. It was a case of making sure that people should get information, should have the information. Yes. Were you part, and I put this ag again to you, were you part of withholding information from any of those organisations? No, because I mean, I clearly stated in my minute in May 2008 that all of those organisations should be informed about the developments in the college. Really? So then when you then said in the same letter on the 24th of October, in taking this unusual action to report this matter to you, and this is to the Commissioner, I am concerned that you should be aware of the very serious statements made by Mr Barrett and the implied threat of some unauthorised action on his part which will damage on Garda Sheikhana. And you then say that he went, he, he's attempting to undermine my professional reputation. So can I ask you, what did you mean by his implied threat of unauthorised action? Well, I had no idea what he was going to do with, 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 in terms of um, with the, with the information that had been uh, had collected. So I, I, in terms of um, what his intentions were or, or not, um, 
So, I mean, I suppose it was a, a general statement there. You can't just make a general statement. You cannot just say that's your response. You wrote a letter to the Commissioner when you uh, talked about uh, Mr Barrett in very disparaging terms as well, when he talked about even his manner, the way in which he uh, goes about his business, and we can, f we can put that to one side. But you, you, you say that you were very concerned that your reputation was being undermined, that it was an implied threat of unauthorised action. You need to be able to substantiate that here today. What did you mean by an implied threat of unauthorised action? You can't just go back to in general terms. You were being specific. So what were you referring to? Answer the question, please, Mr. Colhan. Yes, certainly. Um, but in terms of um, the... Oh, sorry, I'm just going to look at it again. Um, Well, in terms of, uh, I was concerned that there might be some uh, leakage to the press in terms of actually uh, issues that, that should have been um, dealt with in the formal uh, process in terms of sending information to the, to the um, internal order to the CNA. So you did not trust Mr. Barrett, and you felt that Mr. Barrett might go to the press. Is that, is that what you're telling me? It was a concern. I didn't say that I didn't, didn't trust him. Well, okay, but you certainly. Uh, um uh, said that you, you believed he might go to the press. So if you had a concern that this would be an implied threat of an unauthorised action, then I would imagine that would raise trust issues. But you certainly were concerned that he would go to the press. Th that was a possibility. Yeah. Did you go to the press, Mr. Brown? No, I didn't. No. And had you any intention of going no, to the press? I hadn't. OK. But that answer that question, then? Sorry, I just have one, one, one final, just one, last again, it's just, uh, just if you bear with me on this, because it's the same uh, pattern, and it goes to the heart of whether Mr. Colhan uh, actually did his job or not, and I'm just trying to figure out whether he did, and, and uh, it's, I'm not making a statement that he did not. We have to, we have to examine it. But in, in a letter then to Mr. Kelly, on the 13th of October 2016, uh, Mr. Colhan, you said that Mr. Kelly's report was misleading. We have that. This was a letter dated the 13th of October 2016. Yeah. It was a letter that was uh, 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 addressed to uh, Mr. Niall Kelly, Head of Internal Audit. Yeah. So you have that where you say the report was misleading. Uh, do you still believe that his report was misleading, Mr. Colhan? The report is not misleading in terms of the substance of the issues, but in terms of the historical context, um, I believe that there's um, you know, that it was omitted from the report, and that's the, it, that the historical context explains why we are in in the position we are today, and that was omitted. The report deals with the historic context. The report deals with the. Uh, incomplete report of 2016, the 2008 report, the 2010 report, correspondence between commissioners and other people. It references Mr. Howard. So it does deal with the historic uh, issue. So when you said that the report was misleading, I'm trying to figure out what you meant. But you went on further then to say that Mr. Kelly made defamatory comments and you threatened legal proceedings against him. Here we have Cahirlock, a situation where we have the head of the, the, the finance directorate threatening legal action against the head of, of internal audit and saying that I, fi I find uh, your uh, work to be uh, unprofessional, misleading and mischievous. So you made those comments, Mr Colhan. You said that the draft report that you were given, that the contents of that were unprofessional, that the report was unprofessional, misleading and mischievous. So explain to me how it was unprofessional, how it was misleading and how it was mischievous, please. Well, I just don't have to repeat myself, Deputy, in terms of I, I felt that there was inadequate reference to the historical structures and context in which the, the, the issues that arose, for example, in terms of the investments, how they arose, they arose in terms of, obviously, in terms of um, because of the profit... I'll have to stop you there because I'm, I'm putting direct questions to you. I'm going to break down the three words, and, I'm going to, and you said them. I didn't say them. You said them. You accused Mr Kelly of being unprofessional. Do you reject that now? Do you, do you withdraw the fact that you said that at the time of the letter, that he was unprofessional? Sorry, do I... Would, would, you, would you withdraw that today, that the claim that you made in that letter that his report was unprofessional? Well, and it was professional so far as that, you know, in terms of his findings... You said it was correct. unprofessional. You didn't just yes. say... You also you wrote it. You himself. also said it was misleading. Do you agree? Do you still hold the view that his report was misleading? 
Well, in terms of, again, I just have to return to the thing, to the position where the historical context in which all of these issues arose wasn't adequately uh, The historical context in... response does not cut it. And I'm sick of hearing that from you every time a question is put, because I've already explained to you the historic context was dealt with in Mr Kelly's report. There has been two sets of correspondence, one in relation to Mr Barrett, where you attempt to undermine his work, and another set of correspondence in relation to Mr Kelly, when you attempt to undermine his work, and you say in writing that the report was unprofessional, misleading and mischievous. So you have a duty and a responsibility to inform this committee today how it is you believed that his report was unprofessional, misleading and mischievous. Yes. Yeah. You have a duty and you haven't done that, so please explain to me how the report was unprofessional, misleading and mischievous. I mean, there's a lot of um, working parts in, in, in the report and indeed in the operation of Angarda Shekana. Um, so um, I, I suppose it was um, a summary of um, views that I had in terms of um, the contents of, of the report. And again, I know you, you, you've said it several times before, but I mean, there was a history there which, uh, in relation to the college, which wasn't adequately explained. Do you believe, one final question, and what put this to Mr. Kelly and Mr. Barrett, do you believe, Mr. Kelly, that when that letter was written, and when Mr. Colnan, Colhan said your report is unprofessional, misleading and mischievous, and he went further and asked you to amend your report, did you see that as a direct interference in your work and an attempt to get you to either water down or uh, um, lessen the content of your report? Yes. Yes. And did you uh, have a similar experience, Mr Barrett? With respect to the letter written in October uh, 15, I never saw the letter until yesterday. But now that you've seen it, would you have seen that as an attempt to Absolutely. undermine your work? Absolutely. Very deliberate corralling of what I felt was my obligation to deal and illuminate these matters which had long since been left to continue. And do you not see that as serious, Mr Colhan, that we have the Head of Internal Audit and we have the Head of Human Resources who both see it the same way that I do, that you try to undermine their work? We talked earlier about the circling of the wagons, uh, about you said it yourself, things should be kept in-house. Do you not see that you are part of the problem and that you, by, by, by what you put in writing, um, and we've heard from two senior people in uh, civilian roles in Angarda Shikona. They felt you were trying to interfere with their work. Okay. <clears throat> Time's up. So, uh, right, just ahead. answer that last question. I don't see my... Yeah, I don't, I don't see myself as being part of the problem. If anything, I see myself as being part of the solution because of the actions that I have taken on the issues identified in the 2008 report. I have no desire to undermine uh, the professionalism of these two gentlemen. Um, I, now, Kelly is an independent auditor and he produces his reports um, without any, just certainly doesn't, in terms of, um, without any need for any reference to me. So uh, he, I don't see uh, that I've been interfering in his uh, independence. You tried to get him to alter his report. You threatened him with legal action. You said if he did not amend his report, you would seek legal advice and you would take legal action. And you're sitting there tell, telling me that you did not try to interfere with the work of internal audit. It's incredible for you to say that. How could you threaten legal action against the head of internal audit, almost unprecedented, and then say that wasn't an attempt by me to interfere with the work? You cannot say that, Mr. Colhan. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Colhan, today, in front of the PSE, do you still stand over that sentence in omitting these facts to report his unprofessional, misleading and mischievous today? 31st of May 2017. Would you say that today? Um, on reflection, uh, Chairman, um, I, I probably was in wise use of, of those words. Would you like to withdraw that statement? Uh, that you've I think been it would be, Because yes. it's before the committee. That statement is in writing before this committee. Yes, I would like to withdraw it. Yes. So you will withdraw that statement now? Yes. That's helpful. Well, because otherwise, you've earlier said you accept the report. And, yes. and it would be inconsistent to say you accept the report and leave that statement stand. Correct. So that statement is withdrawn. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Captain.